someone who uh, I think always just grew up loving two things, that was food and magazines and books. So food and writing. And um, so I wound up, I'm the, I'm the editor of Plate, which is a food magazine for chefs, but I, it seems like a very well thought out plan, but I, you know, I did study journalism in undergrad and uh, did a lot of writing and in that time. And then I kind of said, well, screw it. I'm gonna go to culinary school and I'm gonna go all in on that. And so I went to New York to the Culinary Institute of America and uh, worked for a caterer there doing all kinds of events and she had a prepared food store and that was exactly what I wanted to do and thank God I worked for her so I learned that that was exactly what I did not want to do. <laughs> and um, so I cooked in restaurants and did some consulting, uh, culinary consulting work and then got, like, found my way back into writing and uh, so was working as a freelance food writer and uh, kind of happily being able to provide this perspective of what it's like to cook and to, uh, to work in restaurants. And then, um, so with Plate, since we're a food magazine for chefs, it works out because I'm able to uh, kind of uh, better understand what chefs are going through, what they're looking for, the difference between avocado toast as a trend for consumers as opposed to what, you know, what they want to have in the kitchen that works and then I get to hang out with cool people like Bill. Yeah. Awesome. And she travels how many days out of the year? Probably like 200 well, maybe. Well <laughs> and actually the, the, the like genesis of this book uh, took place uh, on, a, in the, on a bus in the middle of nowhere in Australia um, yeah. somewhere between I don't know. Brisbane and um, Somewhere, Melbourne, right? Yeah, somewhere between Brisbane and Melbourne. Uh, Bill and his wife, Yvonne, uh, joined me on a, uh, a trip to learn all about Australia uh, since they were, I was asked to bring some chefs there. So that's when the, that was like the germ of the idea. Yeah. So Here we how are. are you? Me? Um, so my journey started, you know, from Korea. I was, I moved here when I was seven, uh, not by choice. Um, my parents wanted to give us a, a better quality of life so we moved and um, you know the the thing that I asked my parents like why didn't we when we had the layaway in LA and Hawaii why did we not stop at those places and live there so uh, we ended up here 1977 in Chicago with the blizzard in February so that was my harsh reality that I was gonna live here and uh, be here for probably, what, 30 years. Um, growing up, going to grade school, high school, went to two culinary school. I was fortunate enough, I found something that I really loved to do at a very early age, and um, really wanted to learn the foundation of cooking, which was not Korean back then. It was uh, French cuisine, so I spent my time learning about the foundation of cooking, um, then took me to Atlanta, um, worked for a French gentleman down there. Then um, I came up for Chicago because I missed home uh, deeply. Um, you know, I'm a huge sports fan, and I know today's draft day, so we have to make sure that the Bears pick the right person. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I had two people that I went to go spend a day or trail or shadow, and they both kind of pointed at this restaurant it was at a townhouse, it was uh, 816 West Armitage, um, and it was a restaurant called Charlie Trotter's, and basically both of these chefs had their own restaurant, but they said, if I were you, I would go to this restaurant. And I had no clue what this restaurant's all about, but when I got there, my world really changed and really um, helped me propel, propel me to what I know now, because it really, that was the focal point of cuisine back in the early 90s. And I was fortunate enough to be there for about three and a half years the first time around. And um, you know, we were voted the number one restaurant in the country back then. Um, we had uh, a table in the kitchen. Uh, we had a $250,000 Rolls Royce of a stove that was one piece that was built in Lyon, France. Um, you know, our, you could eat food off the floor if it need be. Every hour within the hour, 
there's, we call it a sweep and a mop, and we basically we would have the new recruits or re, new cooks that came in. Basically, how you handle the mop and a broom would tell you how that person works. So <laughs> that was the inside jokes between all of us, uh, but that really, you know, made me see outside of Chicago. So I got to travel. I got to eat it. Three three-star Michelin restaurants. Um, I was 26. I didn't know. I had, you know, I tell Chandra all the time, one sport jacket, not a suit. I had one sport jacket, and Charlie said, "I think you're going to need a couple more because we're going to go and and do a book signing in France, meet the French media, go to Switzerland, and I've never traveled outside of Chicago. And when I came back, I knew I had to like leave. I had to see different parts of the world. Uh, so I left for 10 years in the East Coast and got to experience it. But same thing happened where I missed home again. Uh, this time, for 10 years, I, I had my watch and my clock set on Midwestern time, never changed it. And I knew I was going to come back home. And I came back my second tour of duty at Trotter's. I, I was named the chef de cuisine, um, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't that tunnel vision kid 10 years ago working there, and I seen the world, and I'm just like, I, I have to open my own place. And when it was time for me to do that, it wasn't what I was trained to do. I wanted to do something that was more meaningful, which meant, you know, wanted to do food that was closer to me, who I was as a person. My family owned dry cleaners. I always say dry cleaners, but they only own one. My parents you know, washed people's clothes for 35 years, and I seen how hard they worked. So I always told myself, if I got educated here, did something that I really wanted to do, there's no way in hell I was not going to succeed, because they did something they didn't want to do. They sacrificed for us. So that was the synthesis of us. You know, we said, we will build this restaurant, and we will make it work. And the ir irony is, when we built the first restaurant of our own, was in a strip mall, dry cleaners, and a laundromat. <laughs> so we were in a 1,000 square foot place. And we opened in 2008, so it's been 10 years. But the economy was going like this. You know, all the people that I have worked with or uh, my friends who had the higher end restaurant, they were suffering because it was that time. And I really thought the market was missing. You had the high end places, then you had, you know, the fast food restaurants, but there was nothing in between. I'm just like, why can't food not be expensive but still be really, really good? And that's when we opened up Urban Belly. It's counter service. Nothing's over thirteen dollars, and you know we basically said if it's flavorful, it's accessible, affordable to everybody. Hey, you know if I fail on that, I'm okay because when we first when we opened up that restaurant, I lived my dream. That was everything that I could wish for. And I always tell somebody, if I get hit by a car tomorrow, I lived my dream. So then you know, on top of that, we open up. Belly Shack, then Belly Q. We have our sauce line. Now we have a book. I mean, just I pinch myself every day because it's it's all the things I've thought about doing, and we're actually doing it. And with their help, I mean, with my wife's help, it's just you know I surrounded myself with ladies of power, and it's just like I just have to just kind of dream and think, and they they do the pushing and they. They've done very well. <laughs> so when you talk a little bit about the impetus and, and your background, one thing I was curious about is what inspired you, just even at the beginning, in, as you were growing up, that, that made you, gave you that passion to go after going to culinary school, just mm -hmm. at the starting point? Well, you know, when, when you're young, especially when you're from another country, you just want to fit in. You just want, you know, I had a Korean name. It was very hard to pronounce, and I was, you know, I knew when B came around in the alphabet, I'm just like, oh, I need to go hide because they're gonna, they're gonna make fun of you. So, 
you have to tell them. It's Pum Suk. Then my brother's la first name is Yu Suk. So Yu Suk <laughs> or Yu Suk. I mean, that was just, it was so like, come on. Bill then, told me this like the day before <laughs> we had to turn in the manuscript. And I was like, oh my god, I have to go back and rewrite the entire yeah. introduction just so we can get this in. But it's like such a universal experience yeah. if you have a name that's like reflective of another country, you totally remember being a little kid in school knowing like, okay, yep, my name's about to come up and they don't know how yeah. to say it. Yeah. I don't know how you did it. So, you know, the reason why we did the restaurant that we were so driven to do because for selfish reason, I wanted a restaurant of both cultures, right? I wanted you know, I didn't want to eat rice three times a day, which was custom to doing. And I used to go every Friday, I would go to my friend's Joe McDermott's house because I knew every Friday was pizza at their house. <laughs> so I loved that. Then I used to go to Tony Bruno's house because I knew it was Prince Spaghetti Day on Wednesday. <laughs> and I knew what I was going to get at my house. You never knew what you were going to get because we probably ate the leftovers from two days before. So you're eating the same thing all the time. So as we thought about what it meant to open up your restaurant, I think this is a, something that a lot of the chefs sometimes miss out. It's not the concept. It's who you are as a person and how you want to express yourself in the food. That's being genuine. It's not the concept. It's not you know, how well you could cook. Like What's from your heart? And you've got to let that show on the plate of food that you're cooking. So what we are cooking when we open up the restaurant, it's all the things that I wanted to eat. It's what we prepared at home, but I wanted to elevate it. Like my mom used to do fried rice, but she made it with Crisco and she used like 10 pounds of rice and we'd have it for months in the microwave. And we would take it out and it used to never stick because there was tons of Crisco in there. So we said, we're gonna do fried rice. But we also made dumplings at the house. So we did, you know, like we're going to elevate the dumplings, and the dumplings are going to be five different skins, five different unique flavors. Then on top of that, you know, Urban Belly people call it a ramen shop, right? But if you really look at our menu, we only have one damn ramen. So it's no, it's not a ramen shop, it's a noodle shop with five different kinds of noodles. That, because it takes, to me, when you have, when you go spend the time and learn some of the things that I did, it's easy to just do ramen. <coughs> but when you start putting rice cakes, rice noodles, udang, you know, you know, chow fun, it's, it's all these things that it's there. It's for you to kind of go and put some skills in there and make it tasty. So, you know, it's for selfish reasons, so we, we did something that I love eating, but we wanted to elevate it. So, you know, competition wise, I didn't want people to be able to do some of the things because I have a dif different experience than a lot of the other chefs in Chicago and wanted to kind of put our stamp and I wanted to bring to the city something totally different that people are not accustomed to. Yeah. Knowing that you spent some time in fine dining, working for Charlie Trotter, and knowing there's lots of alumni of Charlie Trotters that have gone on in Chicago to, to start restaurants. How would you say being from the Midwest and, um, and just uh, your wife's uh, Puerto Rican descent, mm -hmm. and, um, how that has influenced, like, because it is very genuine. We've been to the restaurant, we've tasted a lot of the food, and yeah, it's, it feels so natural, right? It's, it's truly amazing. But what was that process like, even just starting um, the restaurant and making that move uh, to uh, Urban Belly? Uh, yeah, I think the thing that we, we kept on saying, we want to start taking away. Less is more. Which meant, you know, when you work in fine dining, there's a lot of layers of the hierarchy, who's who, and, and you know, who has seniority, or, you know, we need to have this, this type of service. We just said, you know what, you come, free parking, you don't have to pay for alcohol because it's BYOB five years ago. And you see the menu, you order. We just took all the things out of dining, what people understood, and it was basically to, 
the primitive, like, here's food, you pay, you order, we bring you the food, and that was it. If you don't like it, too bad. But <laughs> it, it, was, it was all about giving it back to the customers, which meant you don't have to valet, you know, you don't have to tip if you don't want to. And here it is. Here's the food, and this is what we're going to do. You're going to get great service. I always said you could do two things. You could say thank you and hello to a customer. That costs nobody any money. If we could do that, that's something that anybody could do. So, you know, and, and going into the, the culture of my wife and I, it's so natural because we always like to, when we do food, we like to say, we like to tell the love story through food, which means when I met my wife, I've never had plantains. But when I had it, I'm just like, wow, how is, how is, can I put this into my food? And I wanted to, not because she's my wife, it's something that I've never had. So we do a dish at Bellicu now, it's called mafongo. So it's plantains that's boiled instead of fried. So I, I try to take the dish apart. First, the traditional way is you take pork skins, chicharrones, you take garlic, almost like a ro uh, mojo, and you just smash it until you just get this like uh, mash plantain. But you know, Chandra hates this, but I use tofu cream cheese. <laughs> that is that is something I that I like using because it, it adds richness without um, being super heavy. Then instead of adding chicharrones, we add crispy tortilla. Then we add our version of chimichurri or mojo. Then we make this like mashed plantain with chimichurri, so it has the flavor of mafongo. It's not traditional, but on top of that, we add kimchi salsa on top of the, I call it mashed plantains, so it kind of gives you a kick, but it all goes well together because we don't just say, this is what we're gonna do. We actually taste it, make sure it goes well together, then we serve it with pork and and plantain chips, so it's a harmonious way of doing it, but my wife definitely has an influence in my cooking, and you know, I kinda have influence on her of cleaning, but she won't let me clean at the house. She's like, no, <laughs> can I use this sponge for this? I'm just like, come on, just let me clean, <laughs> but she won't let me do it. She's uh, I always tell her before she goes shopping, she's like, you gotta take an inventory of cleaning products. Cause she always buys double of everything. I'm like, stop. <laughs> it's not gonna go bad. You gotta take inventory before you go. <laughs> cleaning products are definitely important. I'm thinking about that in my own home life and yeah, the sponge struggle is real. <laughs> Very real. So tell us a little bit more about the book. Um, just in describing the food, I think a lot of our mouths are watering. And just a quick note for everyone here, um, our happy hour, our iffy event afterwards, we're actually gonna have some dishes from the book. So save room. Um, but that in mind, yeah, tell us a little bit more about the book and the process. Tandra. Well, uh, th the book came together really as a reflection of a lot of what Bill's been talking about, which is, how he runs his restaurant. And so when we first sat down and started talking about this, he said, look, here's what I want to do. Like we, you know, Bill trained in French kitchens. I went to culinary school uh, when it was kind of all French, all sort of old school European. And so we're both very used to the idea of mother sauces, these sauces that you use and you just create variations and that's how you make everything in classical French cooking. He created the master sauces for Korean barbecue. And so it's seven different sauces and three spice rubs. And you create those. I like have tubs of them in my, like small little tubs of them in my freezer. And I just make them, throw them in there. And then when I want to make something, I just pull out, okay, I need half a cup of this. I need, you know, three tablespoons of that, mix them up. So you take these seven sauces, three spice rubs, use them all sorts of different combinations. And that's how you make everything in the book. So it's how, he, it's how he runs his restaurants. It's like incredibly efficient. It allows people who maybe don't have a ton of culinary experience training. Um, it allows them to learn a skill because it's very easy to do that. But it's also, it's really cool because so many people, it's only been a week since the book came out, but so many people are like, 
this is so easy. I cannot believe like on a Tuesday night, I'm actually able to make this food. And one thing I really love about it is all of the things that Bill's talking about, like going to hang out with his Italian friend uh, after school or having a Puerto Rican wife, and I think more importantly, a Puerto Rican mother-in-law. Um, yes, my wife doesn't cook. That's <laughs> why so she married you. Yeah. But uh, um, all of those influences, you know, the time working at Charlie Trotter's, um, his time working for Jean Bancher in Atlanta, all of those things come through in the book. So you see um, there's, there's a sauce we called a Korean sauce, and it's his Korean Puerto Rican master sauce that you use and you can uh, you can mix it up and you can use it on any kind of uh, any kind of protein we did that with with a turkey and with the pork mm -hmm. I think in the book and so it's it's really cool to just see all these different flavors and see how Bill's experience traveling to a different country would yield um, a new sauce that you combine in a ton of different ways and make all these great dishes and then you combine yeah. everything again, and you make, we have an entire chapter on leftovers because we're both Asian and we do not waste food. So. <laughs> How to kung fu it, right? Yes. <laughs> I might have to ask you more about that in a minute. Um, I have to say that um, for me personally, I don't do a lot of cooking in the home. I think there's some people here who might be able to attest to that. Um, <laughs> and when looking at the recipes, they seem very accessible. And being in Chicago, the weather's finally getting better. People are beginning to consider dusting off their grills, um, which is pretty exciting, and we want to put them to use. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about some of your favorite dishes from the cookbook, or just go-to things when, you know, for, for you personally, um, when you're in a hurry, or just when you want to entertain people, things you like to cook? Um, you know, a personal favorite in the recipe, it's like, what is your signature dish? Well, the story that I love when we were young uh, we couldn't afford a grill. Um, and the public parks, it's called Forest Preserves in Chicago. So they would have free grills. So we would go as a family on Sundays after church, and we would go have one of those grills, and we put charcoal in there. And as soon as we put the meat on that's been marinating overnight, it's one of the, the recipes, and strangers would come because they would smell the Korean barbecue. And that's you know one of the, the moments in my life that I remember because now it breaks down barrier who you are, what color you are, it's food. And it just opens the gateway to, to people trying something new in somebody else's culture. So that's like, wow, that, that was the moment. And you know, just doing this kind of food, it's, it's easy, accessible, and I think a lot of times when uh, people are cooking Asian food, they're like so intimidated. So we made it very simple for people to go get ingredients. And the last week I've been getting uh, videos on Instagrams of people actually cooking out of the book. So there's moments where I'm like, oh, not, <laughs> not Kore it's supposed to be Korean chili flakes, not chili flakes that you put <laughs> so you know that's like triple the spice that it needs but you know what it is we have to all understand that now more than ever there is no border around what we do so we like to say we're cooking without borders which means you don't have to be an expert but you know i studied it i wanted to do this but Always, when, when you're in a category, when we first opened, people are like, what category do you want to be in? Is it Korean? Is it fusion? And I hate the word fusion because ugh. it's, it's, you know what? Let it be. It could be Asian, and it could be influences from all over. Because it really, you know, when I look at Mexico, what they have, and what's in, um, in Asia, a water chestnut doesn't have to be canned. But what can you find something that's here that's similar in texture? So I look to, you know, Latin cuisine, you have jicama, right? And you get that same texture. So, and then it could go either way. And we use chili in both parts of the world. 
cilantro is called coriander. So like, you could do that all over. And that's what draws the inspiration for me to find the commonality in all the cultures and put it in our food. And hopefully this year, me and my wife will get to go to Greece, which I've never been to, but I know I'm gonna find something there that I'm gonna bring back and it's gonna go into my food because um, you know, olive oil, you know, limes, lemons, things like that, it, it really, those are haunting flavors that I like to use in my food. So when you talk about um, connectedness and how you're creating food without borders, um, technology is also a big factor in breaking down barriers. And would be curious, both from the perspective of the book and also from the perspective of your business as a chef and as a business owner, how technology has helped you. So it's a really loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but maybe we can start with the book yeah. and the collaboration. Well, for the book, I think um, I we're laughing. We're like, oh, I don't even know how we would. We, we would still be working on this book if we had not been able to take advantage of technology. Because as Bill said, I travel a lot uh, for the magazine. But I'm also someone who can and absolutely loves working on airplanes. So I needed to be able to do that. But you know, we're two people who live in Chicago. We're working on this in Chicago. Our editors and uh, you know the whole production team and design team uh, at Ten Speed Press are based in Emeryville, California. But the creative director was based in Santa Barbara. Johnny Autry, our amazing photographer, is based in North Carolina. So we were um, we were utterly we were utterly dependent on on Google Docs and Forms. So thank you, you are our overlords, and we appreciate yeah. what you've done. But that was how that was how we organized everything. Um, we had two recipe testers working and testing recipes, and I could be on an airplane looking at the notes that they put on um, after testing a recipe, and then I could input comments and not lose any time. Uh, when we did our photo shoot, we had a spreadsheet uploaded so that the editorial and design team in, uh, in California could see what we were working on every day, and then every night our photographer was able to upload the photos just so they could see, they could not be, you know, have to worry about flying out to Chicago, but they could be there and, and see what was happening with the photography, how things were looking, and even say, hey, look, think about doing some of these for, you know, backgrounds and that. And that could be, you know, the creative director dropping her daughter off somewhere and taking a look. So that was amazing. And then the thing that um, other people who co authored cookbooks with chefs always, grit their teeth about because they can't believe it was so easy was the fact that I wrote the book with a chef who understands how to upload to Google Docs. So <laughs> uh, a friend of mine co-authored a, a book with a chef and he had to literally sit across the table from him and drag every ingredient out one at a time. And he was like, yeah, we used to sit from five in the afternoon until two in the morning every single Monday to do that. And I was like, oh, yeah, Bill just uploaded all the recipes. It was fine. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think that we wrote this in a very short amount of time. And I think that it was only possible because of that. So, and then I mentioned to you before, my husband Jay is a, is a product manager. And so he has taken it even further and now creates spreadsheets that indicate with formulas in there that indicate like, okay, how far along are you in the process of creating each recipe and how far, how many days behind are you, which is <laughs> the really the worst thing you can ever do to a writer. Yeah. Don't ever do that. Yeah. But then the restaurant, you, you've got the place, I mean, you're, you've got the place set up for efficiency. Yeah. So we just held a smart class this morning. So it's our second time around. So we try to bring technology into our kitchen. So we are Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connected in our kitchen, which is crazy. So I could see on my phone if somebody's using the oven right now at what temperature. And now... Now you're the creepy overlord. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, you know, with, with, the, with the, the phone and also um, now with Wi-Fi built into the ovens, so basically now we download the picture of the finished product. Let's say you're charring broccoli in the oven. So now they have ovens where you could put dry heat and, and uh, humidity at the same time. So you could do 70% uh, 
dry, 30% steam, and you could cook in there, and basically the finished product comes out, we take a picture, download that to the oven, and now a prep cook that just starts, they just have to say, broccoli, show a picture. Now you don't need to remember temperatures or settings, now you just press the picture of the broccoli. Um, you could also, if you're taking something out of the freezer, let's say, and you put it into this, it's called the blast chiller, take it, set it on thaw overnight, and you don't have to run water. You're wasting water, wasting energy, and basically when it come, come the next day, you take it from the frozen stage, then it thaws it out, and you're ready to go, so you're not wasting time. Um, you could also, what's called proofing, you could actually make bread, then you could shock freeze it at negative 40, so it doesn't kill the yeast, but it freezes it. Then two days later, you could take it out before you go home, let it proof very slowly, re relax the dough, so the person coming the next day could actually take it, as soon as they come in, they could bake off the bread, which sometimes could take up to two or three hours in a busy kitchen to take up space. So um, there's also a controlled vapor cooking, which is basically you, if you're making grits or polenta, so is, there's a point where when you're cooking it, it has this like splatter thing that happens, right? And it's like almost getting hit with like heat you need you, you almost need a visor, like a welding hel helmet, because <laughs> the things just kind of bubble. So this control vapor cooking, so you just bring it up to a boil, then you cover it, just put it in the, basically an oven. It's controlled atmospheric cooking. Two hours later, it's completely cooked. So it, w what it does is, first, it gives the person that's actually cooking it complete control of the product, and also, it, it gives that person time to do other things so you don't have to keep an eye on things. It's like the Instapot, everybody's going. So we have an Instapot kind of thing where if you have a braised short rib that you want to do, we could put it in before we go home. Next morning, come uh, hold it at the same temperature. It's completely cooked. So there's efficiency of us cooking while we're not there and it's not by heat it's by electricity and it's controlled 100 percent and it's done so and what that does is i could hire people that need a career out of it not they don't need to be chefs they just need a job and we have people who want a job they want to go home at a certain time they have kids they have other responsibility now we could t teach them a skill that they could provide us, because not everybody's aspiring to be chefs. And we could give people a chance that might not have a chance in life. So these are things that we put in place so we could hire more people. Earlier we were talking about your experience working with Charlie Schroeder, and um, one of the things I think we mentioned before the, the interview was around how he gave back to the community. And uh, kind of what you're describing here, using technology and using these efficiencies in the kitchen, you can provide opportunities to folks. Tell us a little more about how you've been involved in the community in Chicago. Sure. Um, I think, you know, going back, I think a lot of people think, what I've learned there at Charlie Trotter, it was, yes, about cooking, but it was more, I learned taking away the greatest thing ever is to give back. Charlie used to invite 14 students four times a week in his test kitchen from all different parts of the Chicago land area. They would get the same meal as paying guests that night. And all of us people in the kitchen, we'd have to come and explain the definition of excellence. But they would get exactly what people were eating. And now it opened doors to the kids that maybe not get a chance to eat and talk to, you know, we didn't, Charlie didn't want them to be chefs. They just want, he wanted people in different neighborhoods, and usually it was in underserved neighborhoods. They get to kind of dream outside where they live. And now, you know, some of the charities that we work with is 
um, Greater Food Depository. Um, we just, um, my wife's just on the board of called Rock Passage. So it's, it's uh, taking kids who've been in gangs and giving them opportunities to, to, to come to the, the real world and be able to function. Um, Common Threads, the after school program for um, kids um, under 12, um, you know, Meals on Wheels, which Chandra put together every year. And, you know, it, I just like to be part of a community. When, even when my mom, she had her um, dry cleaners, she always bought something from the neighborhood. And it was usually, you know, when the government cheese, when it was there, we would have slices of cheese at our house all the time, even though I was lactose intolerant. Like, we would always have a thing of cheese, and she would support the community even though you know, we didn't live there. She would always purchase that every month. So for, for us, you know, obviously we're in the West Loop, I live in Pilsen, but we do a thing every year and we don't like to put it out there. We call Chef's Giving in East Garfield Park, Inspiration Kitchen, that's really, that's one charity dear to my heart. It's a job, job training program for homeless. Um, and we take people who are artists, some of my friends, uh, chefs, authors, writers, and we, two weeks before Thanksgiving, we will do this like gourmet spread for homeless people. And it's not like, it's actually like truffle mac and cheese, we're, we're doing coconut gravy, you know, turkey, and like, we're doing it like free. Like we pay for all of it, but we want the people in the neighborhood to eat something that is not, and it's from our restaurant, some of us, and some people cook at home, and it's, you know, we don't tell everybody, we only tell people in the neighborhood, and it's, you know, a mile and a half from where we are in the West Loop to go to East Garfield Park. So right now we're gonna open it up to the audience for questions. There is a microphone back here, so if you have questions, please use the mic. Now with social media, everybody's a food critic. I was just curious about what the role of social media plays in decisions you make as far as ingredients or new menus or even just your mood. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> so, you know, I think 2008 when, when we first opened, we had, and Alyssa, you're going to cringe, we had no PR, no marketing, no plans of it. Our very first customer, very first customer, and we, we told this to, to Monica when I saw her uh, last week. Monica Ng, she was uh, the Tribune food writer, one of the food writers at the Chicago Tribune. So she was our very first one customer. Our third customer was Steve Delinsky, the Hungry Hound. He does a feed podcast, right? So he was number three. So they're the ones who kind of blasted off through social media. Then then Twitter, then the, the food forums, they blasted it off to eight or nine months later, we got voted top 50 restaurants by, um, what was it? Um, one of the, the major magazines, I totally forgot. But, you know. Wasn't it Food & Wine? Not Food & Wine, it was um, Travel & Leisure. Travel and & Leisure. Travel & Leisure, so we were in the company, those, out of those top 50 in the country, <coughs> One was us, the other one was Publican, the other one was L2O. So not knowing the power of social media back then, I was very ignorant and just wanted to cook good food. But as we move forward, um, it's utmost important. Um, every day I wake up to what's called Vanga, and it goes out into space, the internet, or the interweb, and I get alerts on my phone, and I wake up to it and see what's out there. Alyssa, who is our marketing manager for, for Cornerstone, she's here and she's, I talk to her probably more than my wife <laughs> and seeing what, what we do, how we do it. Um, it's a strategy, it really is. And food is a given. Now we have to be able to, to be able to have people know what it is that we're doing, but it is, it is right up there 
probably as more important because I, I believe food should be a given. It should be like, that's a standard. Then everything else we have to work at and social media is right there. And we learned so much about what people wanted in a cookbook from reading reviews. So I would, um, you know, when you wake, wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you're a little like, freaked out about everything you've got going on, I would do exactly what you're not supposed to do, which is like grab my phone. And I started reading um, Amazon reader reviews, reviews on Food 52, I see what people were saying about, um, about different grilling books, about Korean books, about cookbooks in general, and what kind of, um, you know, what kind of issues they had. Um, one of the things I really love about our book is the fact that the ten, the recipes for the uh, for the seven sauces and the three spice rubs, which are all very short, they're actually they were printed on the inside back cover, and that was a um, that was a thing I kept bringing up because on Food Fifty Two, uh, so many people commented about how they hated having to flip back and forth in a cookbook to find, oh god, there's a sub recipe and it's on page 36, and now I've got to pay, find page 36, and then I've got to go back to page 79 to find the original recipe. So we kept working, we, it was like a thing that we brought up from the get-go with our editor, and uh, uh, Kelly and Lizzie and Emma, the design team, they kept kind of figuring out, like saying, okay, well maybe we'll do a big pullout, and I was like one day, what if we have different colored ribbons? And then she just texted me back and said, who's going to pay for that? And I was like, OK. <laughs> so they came up with this idea to, to print uh, these base recipes on the inside cover so you don't have to flip around. You can find them. But that's something I wouldn't have known, we wouldn't have known to even ask for and really push for had we not seen the complaints on social media. So sometimes it is for good and not evil. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there, thanks for coming. Um, so I have a couple of questions. The first one is, how do you choose a recipe tester, and how much influence do they have over the direction of the book? Oof. <laughs> I mean, we were fortunate to have very good friends who were starting a business where they were testing recipes. Um, but it's also equally important to send the recipe to someone who doesn't know you. Ideally, someone who doesn't really know how to cook. Um, I volunteer as trivia, okay. just in case you ever need someone in the future. Because you want to know how someone, I mean, if, if Bill hands me a recipe, I've known him and his food for years and years and years, and I, and I cooked in restaurants. And so I will, someone who's very well trained will start to automatically fill in the blanks. But you want someone to say, hey, you've got me soaking rice and then cooking it. Am I cooking it in the water I'm soaking it in, or am I um, adding fresh water? And someone asked that question, I was like, I would never have thought, OK, now we're yeah. adding that back in. Yeah. And it was important for us that people were using a uh, residential stove. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, you know, our commercial stuff is it's probably three times as powerful. So it was very important that that they were using that type of equipment. And also, we were fortunate enough to, you know, our recipe testers, uh, one of them had kids, which I wanted to have because, you know, I would only cook for two at the house, and Chandra also. So there was going to be leftovers, how they were going to use it. And they're like, the kids don't want to eat that broccoli anymore because they've been eating it for days. but. You know, we knew like for six people, this will be this much. And the thing that we also wanted was we wanted all the ingredients to be accessible to the to the grocery store, not specialty markets, because I think that's another thing that I read that people just didn't want to go to like five different places to get things for the recipe. Yeah. So it was very, very important for us to to be accessible to to whole realm of people that want to cook this type of food. Awesome. Um, final question. What is your favorite, both of you, what are your favorite restaurants in Chicago that you don't have major influence from a business perspective over? So you can't pick your own. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I pick Bill's? Um, 
I mean, I feel like there's so many places that are that you know, like there's the the places that are like the special occasion. Oh my gosh, like our friend, uh, our friends John and Karen Shields have a restaurant, um, Smith. They have two restaurants, Smith and The Loyalist, and they're old friends of Bill's from back in the Charlie Trotter days. And you actually found the the location for them. Yeah. Um, Which so, is right down the street. Yeah. So, but um, I love like Smith. It's such a beautiful fine dining experience, but it's not stuffy. It's like modern and very cool. But then they have the Dirty Bird cheeseburger at the Loyalist downstairs, and that is a like, oh my God, I need something good in my life. I'm gonna go <laughs> eat that cheeseburger. So I have to be very neutral. <laughs> so I like to go to neighborhood restaurants. And a restaurant that I go to probably twice a week, it's not even a restaurant, it's actually takeout. It's, it's called Boyo Express on 18th Street. Tuesdays and Thursdays, you get one and a half chicken, tortillas, three different kinds of salsa for like 19 bucks, like that. And it's, it's grilled chicken on live fire. That, to me, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Boyo Express. And you have to call ahead because they will sell out. Yeah. Boyo Express. Yes. yes. Okay, now I sound like a total snob. Okay. <laughs> you are. You right ah. Not just kidding. <laughs> All right, I think we have one more question coming up. Uh, thanks again for doing. Um, I think one of the things that you were talking about in terms of you know, finding like almost uh, that type of food or category of food. Um, and you hating the word fusion, and then people also wanting something super authentic. Um, what's that kind of balance like in, in trying to find something that's authentic, not fusion, but still something that's authentic to your restaurant? Yeah. I, did I tell you I love the word authentic? Not, no. <laughs> it's, here's the thing that I think everybody wants to find that restaurant that is like, the paradise. The, there is the grandmother that's cooking, and, and it doesn't, the rendition of the recipe is passed on from generation to generation. You know, I can't cook like that. I have to be authentic to who I am. My experience in life is not Korea. I moved when I was seven, so I know very little about it. And as I grew up, my mom would never tell me recipes. I would go into the kitchen, I would taste test for her, but it was never like she, she's like, come on, let's go, we're gonna cook. It was never about that. So I got my authentic experience from the chefs that I trained with. And from there, me finding my identity again back to Korea because I was proud. After I graduated to culinary school, my mission was to cook Asian food the best way that I know how. Not Korean food, but Asian food, because that was missing. Because I knew it was missing because after I graduated, I wanted to find the master, the sensei, the, the guy, or the, the lady that I wanted to work for to learn everything what they know. And there was no such person. And so I started finding these little techniques and little skills from people that I work for. My business plan was to open up that, that authentic restaurant that was authentic to me. So I'm not gonna be at the Hansu Gamsan, the Chosun Oak. Uh, I can't, I don't know how. And that's the thing, you know, I make vegan kimchi. That's not traditional, but I know that's the best rendition of vegan kimchi that I know without using fish sauce, uh, without using shrimp paste, because I'm listening to my customers, because they're like, well, I can't eat shellfish. I can't eat fish. Why can't you do a vegetarian one? Well, we made it gluten-free, you know, vegan, and we do our best version of that. So is that traditional? No, it's not. But is it pleasing to the general public? Yes, it is. So I have to listen to how a business is run but I take, I have a conversation with my mom and she makes her own soy sauce. Is that traditional? No, she has tons of time so she could do that. I, we cannot, so we have to buy it. But talking to her 
takes me back that tradition of, you know, maybe, you know, son to, to father, mother to daughter, you know, mother to son. I feel like I'm getting the authentic version of what I'm doing because I'm conversing with her. I'm getting the history of why. And from there, we, we do it to the general public where we got to take that recipe that may, maybe my mom told me and times it by 200 plus by five days, six days, seven days. Now that recipe is 1,400 portions of whatever. Is that traditional? No, it has to be commercial enough for us to, to function as a restaurant then go beyond. So it, it, there needs to be a balance of whose tradition and how you grew up and being authentic to who you are as a person because you know that and, and it, it, it hits a spot with me because it's like I can't be authentic to my tradition because I was kind of taken away so I have to find my own way to discover where I am and what I'm cooking and this is what I study to do so this is our version of authentic you know, recipes of where we are. We do, a, we do a Thai curry bolognese. Is that authentic? Mm -hmm. It's not, but I know what a bolognese is supposed to taste like. I've made bolognese. But why not take all the elements of the bolognese and using instead of using pork, we use tea smoked duck. Now we have you know, pasta that's made with Shaoxing wine instead of duck eggs to make it. Is it lighter? Yes, it is. Is it more flavorful? I think so. But it is our rendition of authentic dishes that I get um, basically inspired by, because I love Italian food. And we put our spin on it. So it's a very hard question to ask, I mean, to answer. But that's the answer that I could give. You do make the most authentic Korean, Puerto Rican, Italian, Thai, <laughs> Vietnamese, Chicago, Midwestern, French food I've ever had. Two questions. One is, what's your favorite market if you're shopping more for yourself, not for the restaurants? Yeah. I know what Chandra's is. Because I live across the street. Yes, you do. <laughs> so I live across the street from a, a grocery store called Harvest Time, which is like one of the great independent grocery stores. On Lawrence, yes. But, um, I mean, we both love Green City Market. Mm -hmm. Bill's been, you know, working with some of the farmers there for decades. Yeah. So if you want, you got to get this experience, okay? Sunday, about 2.30, go to Kimball and Lawrence. Make sure you wear pants with bumpers on there because you will go to chaos, controlled chaos at Chungbu Market. <laughs> and it's a Korean market. And, and, and there is no word in Korean called excuse me. And it's just like, boom, boom, boom. Somebody will bump into you, and it's, you got to have that experience. Exactly. In the, parking, yeah. in the parking, the tendon's like this, and everybody's pulling out. you got to get that experience. <laughs> OK, second question. Just given the spices and the richness of the flavors in in Korean food in particular, is there a particular type of style of like wine that you found that pairs well, or how do you approach that? I, I'm not a huge drinker, but when I do um, different realms of spices, it's usually cut by um, Sauvignon Blanc, or I like to have beer. Rosé is really good. Um, you know, a margarita is also delicious. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's really, I spent 20 years of my life, like we would, at, at Charlie Trotter, if somebody came in to start off their meal with red wine, right, we would stop what we were doing, then we would have to do a red wine menu on a dime. So I get it, but for me, it's really up to you how you want your food to be, and, and the recipes are all about that. And if you want to drink Kool-Aid, or if you want to drink Gatorade, or lemonade, it's really up to you, and you make that experience. Because we all do it, right? Like, I, my wife, she's very particular about what she drinks. I'm just like, 
give me an iced tea. I'll, I'll drink it with, you know, uh, a steak with, you know, maitre d' butter. And I'm okay. It's, 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 it's really up to the individual what they want to experience. And it's really, it shouldn't be about the beverage you're drinking. Obviously, you want it to be, like, so perfect. And, you know, those recommendation with beer and the, the white and the rosé is awesome. But it's really, you make your own experience, I think. And even with the recipe, you make it your own experience. He does say uh, in the recipe for the uh, chicken drumsticks that he used to always drink Tang with them when he was a kid. Tang. So there's Tang. Yeah, Tang. I don't know if Tang's around, but <laughs> yeah. It's the ideal pairing. <laughs> yeah. You would have given your Samoy experience. I mean, I, and certainly my experience is not like as a psalm working on the floor. I mean, I, um, I think what Bill said is very accurate. Like I drank a lot of, um, I did have to drink while writing this book. Um, <laughs> I, um, I really liked also um, a lot of uh, Pinot Gris, I think works really well with those flavors, Viognier um, as well. Something that's very sort of fruit forward, it works really nicely with the spice. But um, also, you know, I, I think like anything kind of sparkling helps because it, clen it actually like cleanses your palate in between bites. So you don't get this overload from the like the buildup of all of the seasonings kind of killing your, your palate there. So when in doubt, drink a beer. Yeah. Okay, well, I have one final question. It's a Q&A on behalf of Craig uh, on our cafe team uh, for the Food Talks program. Uh, and just a quick plug, uh, that today's talk is very much a collaboration between the Google Food program and Talks at Google. Uh, and we periodically will do these types of talks just to get folks engaged. Um, but one of the things we're thinking about a lot uh, on the cafe side is about food waste and how we can reduce that and how we can be smarter about um, maybe making something new out of what was cooked on Monday yeah. or what have you. Uh, and you have an entire chapter dedicated to reducing food waste. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, I gotta be very honest, my wife hates leftovers. She, after two days, she will not eat it, she will not touch it. So guess what? I always tell her that I got this from the restaurant or I bought it someplace, but it's actually, <laughs> Redone, right? Re I use the leftovers. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's it's part of cooking that is very underutilized because, to me, that's how I learned how to cook. Like, you take spaghetti sauce, and if you make more than what you have, like, what do you do with it? Do you not make spaghetti with spaghetti sauce? No, you could actually make tomato soup by adding maybe a little cream and, and you know blending some basil in there. So I love cooking like that and the book is entirely dedicated to that kind of cooking. It's uh, not wasting and, and being able to use um, you know everything. Like we don't have bread at the house. You know why? Because I don't like bread when it gets stale so we have rice cakes. I eat rice cakes like nobody's business because it doesn't go stale. So like, I'm very practical about how we use the food. So when we buy a whole chicken, yes, I don't, I don't turn on my stove to, to cook chicken. So we buy that like rotisserie chicken. So that turns into three meals. So the second day my wife's at work and I make soup and she's like, I like, I bought soup, here it is. But she doesn't know it's from the same chicken. You know, then we'll do chicken salad so now we're taking that chicken, so we have three recipes out of it. So that's how we like to kind of um, not have food waste at the house. You know, cilantro is used many different ways, and this has to be a secret that my wife doesn't know. It's like we make pesto and we, we use it in soups, and sometimes I might add oil, but it's just constant. You know, even sometimes when I have Parmesan cheese left over from a, you know, take out, that will go into something, but my wife does not know. Because <laughs> she does not Hopefully she will see. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you're right, we do have yeah. an entire chapter in the book that's all about how to use leftovers. And so there are recipes for, hey, if you happen to have some extra, um, you know, if you happen to have some extra like leftover lamb chops, and, or if you have extra skirt steak, say, and like, 
the kind of the worst way to approach leftovers like that is to say, oh, I grilled this skirt steak two days ago, so now I'm going to eat it with the expect the same way and expect that it's going to taste like it did just off the grill. But you can thinly slice it. You can toss it with some udon noodles and um, maybe some of the Korean pesto that's in the like one of the recipes in the book. And suddenly you're making it into something that's totally different. So we have recipes that Bill created that are all about how to take different, um, you know, leftovers from different things because. You know, once you look at grilled left like leftover grilled asparagus that's sitting in your fridge, like you've got to do something to it because you're not going to just eat it the way you would if it just came off the grill. But mixed up in a salad, mixed up in a sandwich, it's great. And yeah. so we also created all these different matrices to help guide readers and users to, okay, if you you know take a protein, you want to add like a nice veg to it, you want to add some kind of starch, and here are all these different examples and then mix and match whatever you've got in your kitchen. And, you know, so you don't have to go out maybe and find something special, but you can, you can pull through, pull all your leftovers out of the fridge and create a really cool noodle bowl or a salad or um, a grain bowl or something like that based on what you've got left over. So don't waste mm -hmm. anything. Awesome. Although Yvonne is going to kill you after she hears this. Yeah, right. <laughs> Only Alyssa and Chandra will tell, so I know who. <laughs> so we should all say hi to Yvonne. Right <laughs> all right. Well, everyone, thanks so much for coming out. Please give a warm round of applause for Jeff Kim and Chandra Ram. Thank you so much. <laughs>